of drastic changes getting rid of this beard of, uh, and, and looking nice <laughs> thanks for chill. is someone recording this call yeah I, i've turned it on but it's not started yet it's processing oh yeah of course okay. i'll post it on youtube or something i suppose or Maybe. All right. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. So, um, hello everyone. <laughs> okay. um, I'm, I'm Dave Crossmans, um, and I'm the program manager for Google Fonts. Um, I set up this call with Lawrence Penny and all of you uh, to um, allow Lawrence to uh, give an overview of his Samsa project, which is a variable font inspector, all written in JavaScript with no dependencies, and um, it's a way of sort of prototyping. Uh, you know, potential kind of interfaces for looking at variable fonts. And um, Lawrence has gone, I think, further than anyone I've seen in terms of um, you know, really uh, uh, diving into all of the different kinds of um, information in the open type variations tables. So I'm particularly interested to see um, you know, uh, him talk about his work on SAMHSA recently on the AVAR and STAT tables. Um, because these are things which were introduced, you know, back in 2016, um, and unfortunately, um, you know, we just haven't. I haven't seen a lot of uh, uptake in terms of user interfaces taking advantage of this kind of information that's in the stat table. Um, and um, uh, there's, you know, the the, the AVAR table allows us to sort of bend the design space and um, improve the way that interpolation works. If you just go along a straight line, it can be a little bit too simple. Um, in the rate of change versus what you want typographically. So the AVAR table allows us to adjust that, and um, not a lot of typefaces are using that AVAR table. Producing it is still a little bit complicated, and visualizing what's going on also can be you know, tricky. So um, Lawrence is, is uh, really you know, moving ahead the whole industry in, in this project. So um, I'm excited to um, you know, learn more about it, learn the latest updates. And uh, at this point, we'll hand over you, Lawrence, and you can share your screen and uh, um, take, us, take uh, us away. Oh, thank you, Dave. I will do that. Um, there's a lot to cover today. I'll get going. I won't wait for any more people to join because we're hopefully the recording will come out well and they can <clears throat> catch up later. Uh, first of all, there are just what SAMHSA does. Dave summarized it. It's, it's talked about quite a lot of the things. I'll summarize it in terms of parsing variable font, so it brings the variable font into its own data structure. That's uh, the main thing that um, SAMHSA does. Then it can do um, do interesting things with them. And the one thing that it does uh, that I um, that I thought that is the prettiest thing about it is it visualizes what's going on inside the variable font. So the maths, the geometry that was all hidden from you, and you had to sort of guess at or um, deduce um, that's now right in front of you with colored arrows and stuff. And, and various other parts of the variable form are visualized as well. It's not just the geometry. Um, so bringing those things out of these raw data tables. Um, it's also able to create static instances out of variable form. So once you bring them into the, its own data structure, you can run all the so-called GVAR tables. So that's all the variation data, how each point moves around under various conditions. And then you have a new set of points for every single glyph. And then why not um, throw those out into a new true type file, a, a static true type, a, a much a smaller thing than the original variable font. Um, maybe it's useful in places where variable fonts aren't, aren't able to be used yet. So as a kind of what, what we call in as, as programmers a polyfill, so a way of bringing in a a new technology into an older system by means of um, a, a kind of plugin or something. Um, and uh, the, the last thing it does, which um, I think is novel, that I haven't seen other apps do this, is create SVG. So it's, it's able to make graphics from variable fonts. So again, we've got the got all the data in memory. We've processed it with the, the variation data. We can create nice graphics with that to save and to an analyze later or to use in marketing or uh, font specimens in QA, that's that kind of thing. Uh, right, so prerequis prerequisites for the talk. Um, I by no means want to say people hang up now if you haven't got these prerequisites, but you will get a lot more out of this if you already know what a variable font is and ideally have made one, have tried to make one. Um, secondly, you know what a design space 
is so a design space very briefly is the abstract space in which we can move around all the different variations in our font um, so we talk about a number of axes in our design space if you don't know what that is i, I don't have time to explain it now um, i'll kindly ask you to uh, go off and have another look and maybe watch the video. Um, so you will get a lot more out of it out of this talk if you know what those two things are. So um, as Dave said, Jam Job um, Samsa is a uh, written in JavaScript. It doesn't depend on any other libraries. It um, it makes large makes wide use of SVG. So everything, all the graphics you see are in SVG. It's very small. It doesn't take up much code. Uh, it's pretty fast uh, compared to other ways of of doing this kind of thing. It uh, doesn't require any installation. It's a very much a live project. Um, so I'm doing changes, pushing changes most days. And finally, uh, Dave didn't mention it's open source. And that, well, that is thanks to Google, who funded the project in 2019. Um, I actually tried to get funding for the project in 2017, but probably didn't um, do hard enough a sell on, on it. Um, but it turned out to be exactly what Dave was looking for. And so that enabled open sourcing and lots of lots of development. Uh, right. So let me switch to let me share screen. Uh, I'm a bit new to Google Meet, but it's uh, there we are. I'll present now. Uh, do the entire screen. Uh, let me get rid of that and that. Uh, <clears throat> Right, you will see that it's just I haven't. This this will be ninety percent um, me doing stuff on screen with Samsa. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not seeing your screen share. Not seeing anything. Oh, sorry. Okay, let me. Oh, I need to select the screen. Right. Yep. Everyone got that now? Yeah, it's working great. Yep. Okay. So. This isn't going to be a slideshow, so you're just seeing uh, a few slides I've made in, in Keynote just to help us uh, remember where we are and a few graphics. Um, so 90% of what we do today is going to be uh, me operating SAMHSA and a little bit of me operating it on the command line as well. Um, so let me go through. Um, the next slide was some places to go if you're new to variable fonts. So there's some very nice talks uh, by Jason Pamental. Um, and Mandy Michael, if you want to find out some basics and, and some cool stuff you can do with variable fonts. Um, I put a little talk I did a couple of years ago. It's a little bit out of date now, but it's intended as an introductory talk on variable fonts. So um, give you the links to those later if you like. Um, but those are where to find an introduction to this stuff. As I said, this is a reasonably advanced uh, talk, so we'll get on. That's where SAMHSA lives. It lives on GitHub um, at um, so those are all the files and folders that uh, that are SAMHSA. Um, it's that URL. Um, but that's not where to play with it. Where, where you actually can play with a live installation of SAMHSA are at those two URLs. So it, all the files you put on GitHub, they can be turned into a live website from those very files that you've just um, uploaded to GitHub. That's the first link there. The second link is an exact mirror of that, that I, every time I upload some stuff to GitHub, I also put it on this SAMHSA slash SAMHSA link on Access for Access. So either of those two links should be equivalent. The only difference is, is a list of fonts, which is only different because of rights issues. For some fonts I can't host on GitHub because they're, um, they don't have the, the, uh, an open license. Uh, right, I'll switch to SAMHSA now. And let me see it's right. So that is what you get when you load SAMHSA for the first time uh, on any of the links. Um, I'm actually running it. If you look at the top of my screen, you can see it's running off localhost. So that is a little web server inside my own laptop. And this is very common for developers to do this. It's extremely handy uh, to run a real web server coming out of your laptop. It doesn't go anywhere beyond your laptop, but it's just a nice way of um, running uh, apps in development. And it's also recommended. Uh, this is my personal favorite way to, to run Samsung. I do recommend it um, because you can you then have a little bit more power of what you can do during the run of Samsung. You can load new files. Um, the fourth way of running Samsa is to just download the zip file off GitHub and double click the HTML file. That will work. 
uh, but you won't be able to load anything dynamically. And that affects this list of fonts you see here on the left. You can't load those dyna dynamically. That list is blank if you just do that double click. Uh, also, there's some dynamic help features I'm building in, and they they don't they won't work either if you do that double click method. But if you install it on a local web server, um, the other advantage of installing it on a local web server is you can customize this list of fonts. Um, it's easy to do. There's a, a JSON file. Uh, you customize your list, just stick your own fonts in that list. Very handy if you're working on your own variable fonts and maybe want to compare them to the variable fonts that Adobe is making, that kind of thing. Um, just build your, own, build your own list there. Uh, so before I open a font, I'll just show you that list of uh, gray blocks on the left. That's what I call, they're what I call panels. And each time I add a distinct new um, view on the font, or on the UI, I add it as a panel. It's not, it's not ideal. Um, ideally, I'd be able to drag these panels off and put them where I want on, on the screen and maybe save that layout. That, that may well come later. But currently, I'm, um, if you'll um, forgive the slight lack of usability, this, everything is dumped into that left-hand column, which, which scrolls, scrolls up and down. Um, right, so the easiest thing to do when you're loading, using it for the first time, you can either drag one of your own variable fonts uh, that you have, or just click here to load one um, from a list of stored fonts on uh, that Samsung has access, access to. So here are various different fonts that you can load just with a click on this list here. Uh, when you load a font, um, it populates all its glyphs, every single one in this glyphs panel down there, uh, but it, it populates all these panels. So the info gets some predictable information about the file name, file size, some bits and pieces from the name table. Um, uh, and that's, and I'm going to explain how Samsung works by going through these panels uh, one by one it, um, and then focusing on the ones that are particularly interesting. Uh, I'll stop now at the, the UI uh, panel. Uh, that's a way of. Um, changing the view on this thing. And what we're looking at, that big uh, uppercase A, it always tries to grab a, a uppercase A if there is one in the font. Uh, it'll just go to the very first glyph, um, apart from the not, not deaf glyph, if there is no uh, uppercase A in the font. Uh, so it grabs that, uh, and it turns it into SVG. So you're, what you're looking at is a piece of SVG that's brought in uh, to the browser, and all brand browsers handle SVG very nicely. It's effectively like a little Illustrator file. It's, uh, most Illustrator files you can save as SVG without any loss. So this is a nice scalable graphic. Um, and it's very structured as well. It's in a number of layers. Uh, each one you can color elements. Um, after you've made the SVG, you can, sort of go, you can edit that SVG, change colors, and change line width, line thicknesses, and things like that. Um, so I found it an extremely nice way of, of, of working. Uh, right, so you're looking at a piece of SVG, bear, bear that in mind. Um, and you've got these axis controls, so you can play around with how the, how the glyph looks. I'll explain these arrows later. Um, but for the moment, look at the different UI possibilities. We've got a light mode. and that, So imagine each of these UI modes sets up a load of line thicknesses and colors uh, with which it displays um, the glyph. Preview is a... Nice obvious one. Um, by the way, if you're in another mode and want a preview, just press space, hold it down, it comes again. That'll switch to the preview mode. Look I, I'll explain that later. That looks very weird. Um, I'll talk about that uh, later. So you've got four UI modes there. You can actually add your own very easily. Um, I'll show you where that is if you're into coding at all. Um, and I'll probably make this easier if there's uh, some demand for it because there, is a, there are good reasons you want, you'd want to add your own. So there's this bit of JavaScript here, which defines the light UI mode. So you can see it's defining the default glyph, what color is going to be filled, what color is the stroke going to be, what color is the stroke, what width is the stroke, uh, what, how are the point numbers going to be drawn, this kind of thing. Uh, so there's another one for the dark mode. You can add your own there. So add your own, reload, and you'll have a new UI mode in that drop down there. You can switch to it at any time. Uh, right, the other th things in that um, UI control are you can put on even more arrows if uh, all these arrows aren't enough. Uh, but I'll, I'll first 
talk about these total deltas, the, these arrows that I call total deltas. This is the uh, total movement of each point. So what we're looking at in gray, that faded gray out, uh, glyph in the background, that's the default glyph for this, um, th that's the default instance for this glyph. Um, the, ver the way variable fonts work is they have all the tables that a traditional font would have, including the glyph definitions. And that it, once that font becomes variable, we call that the default glyph. And the variations are defined as differences from that default. So every point um, is um, in the, let's say, the wide master or the bold master is defined as its difference from that the position of that point in the default master. And so this is what we're seeing is the accumulated differences we call deltas of every point from the, its default position. And you might have seen visualiz visualizations like this before. What SAMHSA does that's new is um, it allows you to split the contributions of those arrows. You see the points haven't moved location. They're still doing exactly the same. We can prove that by showing all these arrows at the same time. Um, but with the split deltas, we're showing where each piece of that delta has come from. So vector addition, for those that remember it from their maths classes, you, you can add vectors together. Um, and that takes account not just of their magnitude, but their angle as well. And the result is where, just like going along a, a path for a certain distance at a certain angle, uh, you, the sum of those vectors um, takes all that into account. Um, all the delta, all the differences in x, all the differences in y, and produces a new, a new value. That split deltas. Uh, we also have a point number UI there, just to switch that on and off. So this glyph has twenty points, I think, numbered from zero to nineteen. Uh, right. Oh, by the way, actually, one new thing I've added uh, just in the last few days are these little I buttons. Can you see those? Uh, that brings up um, little help window for that panel. So if you get, so this is, um, I've only just added this and this is far from complete. So if you, and even the ones that are, that have a reason, reasonable amount of data there, reasonable amount of text, it's just my first draft. So as you can see the, uh, the info, you know, they're not all there, um, but a few of them are. Um, so that, that will help you uh, play around with this. Um, those are on GitHub, just like the rest of the project. So please feel free to um, suggest changes to those. And that's one of the things that won't work if you install this um, just with the, with the uh, double click um, method. Uh, but it, it, it works perfectly fine on GitHub and Access Praxis and local installations. Right, let's move on to the Axis panel. Uh, you've surely seen uh, panels like this if you've ever played with a variable font. This uh, uh, so Illustrator has them, Access Praxis has them, Dynamo Darkroom has them. You've seen you've seen them, and they work just the same. Uh, but there are some extra features in in this one. Uh, I'll go through each row here. Um, so the tag is the four character tag name. That's the internal name used in the font for the width axis. We all we must use WTH WDTH if we want to express to applications and operating systems that this axis controls width. Um, so this um, is uh, this this is reg this is a registered axis in the open type specification. Um, so is WGHT for for weight. Um, the next column along we can actually see what that axis means. So we can click it now. That now opens up a new window where the width axis specification is shown. And I've hooked those up for all the registered axes, that's f axes, that's five of those. Also hooked it up to the tight network axes, if you know about those. And also there's three or four axis proposals. So um, you can go straight to the place where they're defined. Next column is just a regular human readable name. Don't need to talk about that. Next, we show the minimum default and maximum for each axis. I'm using this home icon uh, throughout SAMHSA to, to represent default positions. Um, we can click on those column headings to flip straight to the default on both axes, on all axes, max on all axes, minimum on both axes. We can double click on the 
uh, axis tag to default just to that particular axis. Uh, the fourth column, the green one, is the current value of that axis. Uh, down here, again, this is something that uh, I haven't seen other apps do. This is what shows. This is showing the same number, the same axis value, in four different um, presentations. It's a bit like um, formatting a number in Excel. You can choose how to see that number. And you might think, why well, all those other numbers look rather weird? Um, but they all have their uses. Now, the first one, uh, sorry, the second one, user hex. That is the hexadecimal representation of the four byte uh, number that is used inside the true type file. So if you dive into a TTF, look at the FR table, you will see these, these four bytes expressing the, the minimum value for the width axis. You'll see these four expressing the default. You'll see these four expressing the max. Uh, this is the current value also expressed in the same so-called 16.16 .16 format if, if you want to look that up in the open type spec so it's a four byte format that has two bytes of integer precision and two bytes of uh, fractional precision uh, so those are what you find in in, in a font file in various places next one i show is the normalized um, num number format so this is showing um, how the what the what the number is converted to deep in the variable form engine and these values are used quite a lot in inside variable font processing and how they're arrived at um, I'm going to go back to the slideshow and show you this graphic this uh, shows a typical two axis setup um, so it, you can typically oh, you, you might as well represent that as a square that's fine um, so we've got width along the x-axis x -axis on this uh, space, design space. We've got y, uh, sorry, we've got uh, width expressed on the y-axis of this design space. You can see that the default is rather offset because the default isn't closer to the, to the default weight is closer to minimum weight than maximum weight. And default width is also closer to uh, minimum width than it is to maximum width. So these are, little bit distorted from the pure uh, square, um, that cross being off center. And that's a very typical uh, setup. So this particular setup has its default in the center, um, its max over here, its max in both weight and width up here, and its max in just width here. <laughs> um, now, the way the variable font system works is these four quadrants of the square are treated kind of independently. So what happens here is like the old fashioned four master, multiple master setup. It's interpolating between those four masters. What happens in this, with these, between these four masters, again, similarly, it's like a, an old four, four master, multiple master setup. Same here, same here. Now you don't have to have these negative regions. And if your default is at the min or default is at the max, then some of these quadrants go away. But this is the general scheme of things. And it's very common, I say. And particularly because you often want to express where the regular kind of weight is, the regular width. So you often want to have, have a good lot of control over that. Uh, anyway, a little digression. What happens to these numbers? So these are all still in user coordinates. We're now going to flip to what we call the normalized coordinates. So these are based on a minus 1 to plus 1 scale. Uh, so all the minimum values take the value minus one, all the maximum values take the value plus one. The defaults take the value zero. And once you have that set up, of course, uh, you do have a, a square with the cross right in the center of it. Now, when you have a, a user value that needs to be, so, so that's, we've talked about um, the values on the extremes and in the default. Of course, this normalization process applies to the values uh, all over the design space, and they are they become values between minus one and plus one proportionally to where they were in that user space, wow. and those are the values okay, that are then used. Yes, this is. Sure. It's on trying to speak. Hi, this is Laura with Dr. Connor's office. Yeah, hi Laura, how are you? Happy Friday. All right. So, uh, hearing someone's mic on, could we um, maybe mute? Thank you. Um, so, this is Laura with Dr. Connor's office. Yeah, hi Laura, how are you? 
Right, so we now have um, two values, or however many axes we have, there's two, two axes set up, we have our two normalized values, and they, go, they get sent further deeper into the variable form um, system. So we can look at those values. Before we were looking at values between zero and 1,000 for this particular font, we're now looking at values between, values between zero and one. We don't have neg negative numbers on this particular font because default is the same as minimum. Uh, what can we do with these numbers between zero and one? Uh, well, we, we do find them in various tables. If we take the TTX dumps of, of a font, we find them, we can actually hack TTX RVRN tables using these values. We can work out uh, if, we, if we go back to user values, if we want to jump from one glyph form to another to happen at 722, let's say, we can then look at the normalized value and see what it is in normalized coordinates. And that value, we can then plug into TTX. That'll work just fine. Um, other uses of uh, normalized values are when we look at it, what it's really, how it's really represented, which is as a two byte number now in the so-called 2.14 format. That's two digits of integer precision, 14 digits of fractional. So they, these become these rather mysterious hex numbers. The nice thing about using these, um, again, these are the things you see if you uh, crack open an AVAR table, for example, you'll see these numbers. Um, but these, are the, these represent the lowest resolution at which a variable font operates. It cannot represent a number between those values. So as you see, I'm using these plus and minus buttons to just increment and decrement that axis value by the smallest possible value in the variable font format. Uh, we're not seeing any change here because they're too small to see, which is as we'd hope. Um, but in certain situations, I'm going to show you one now. This uh, font called Skier was actually made about 27 years ago uh, in the first iteration of this format called TrueType GX. It still works perfectly well today. Um, its Q has, uh, whoops. Um, its queue has some cool features. And first of all, it just looks like it's fine. But if we, we see that around, do you see that around 2.2, where was it, 2.25, the stroke of the queue jumps to a new location. And now this was built way before this RVRN feature variations concept was, was invented. Um, so this has to use intermediate masters. And the way you uh, implement this kind of um, switch at a certain point in the design space um, with this, with, uh, without the possibility of feature variations is you've got to put these intermediate masters very close together. And we can actually see using the norm hex view, we can work out what, around where, where that is. So we'd, we reckon we're just before it now. So as we increment it step by step, did you see that? We flipped at a certain point. Let's go back, I'm going re reversing now. At 247B, we find an intermediate position. So 247A is the last position where you had the full, stro full stroke. 247C is the first position that the new stroke. So those two positions represent where the two intermediate masters are. They're very close. But I would say they're not quite close enough. That, to me, looks like a bug. You can see it, it's reflected in the, in the web font view there. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention what the web font view is doing. That is um, showing the font hooked up just as like a normal web font. So it's not going through any of SAMHSA's uh, parsing or anything like that. It's just grabbed the TTF data, brought it into the browser as a web font, just like Access Praxis does or Dynamo Darkroom. It just it added it to the web page as a, as, a, as a web font. So it's using a totally different renderer. But it's nice to see in very specific cases like this that we're getting the same, the same image, the same, same glyph shape. Uh, so you could fix that bug by diving into that GVAR table for the queue, finding all those 247As and switching them to 247B. And you'd, you'd fix that 27-year-old bug. Um, so if you're using intermediate masters to switch your fonts in this way, make sure those intermediate masters are at that precise closeness that you need. 
um, which might not be obvious how to, uh, where to actually put your numbers for those masters in your um, in your font design app. Okay, uh, that's all I have to say on the axes uh, table, except that add instance button. Um, and what that does, I need to jump forward to this instances panel now. What that is showing is all the so-called named instances in the font. So those don't really represent much data at all. All, all what a named instance is is a piece of text. There we are. We've got the word black, um, along with two coordinates. Two coordinates because this is a two-axis font that say where black is to be found in the design space. And everything else happens on the fly. That's how variable fonts work. So that's what a named instance is, naming one of those points. And I'm using that bookmark uh, icon on the left to represent it's a sort of bookmark in the in the full within the full freedom of the design space. I'm using that home icon there to say that's the default. Uh, so if you click there, it's not really a uh, it's not a named instance, but I'm calling it an instance uh, for, for these purposes. Um, if we want a custom instance, we can add instance there. Now that has added a new instance there. Uh, now this is it's not going to add it to the variable font. So it's, Samsa, by the way, does not export new variable fonts. Um, it just for inspecting variable fonts, but it can uh, adjust its own data structures uh, while you're running it on a particular variable font. And that's what it's done here. It's added a new instance. It's given it a different icon. Those sliders indicating it's a custom one, um, and it's recorded its axis location. Um, so what can we do once we have um, a custom axis now? Well, we can uh, we can give it a nice name. Uh, and we can um, generate an instance. We can make a new TTF just by clicking that button. Uh, did we do it there? Yeah, right. So what that's done, did you see the little icon going to the downloads folder? So that's skier.ttf. That's just been created out of SAMHSA. Um, and it's a fresh, it's just, it just saves the glyphs at their new locations. It's no longer a variable font. It is a perfectly usable font. Um, it's, I'll show, I'll show it for a simpler one so it loads quickly into glyphs. Um, so if we look at Mutator Sans, it's a nice small font. Let's uh, take that instance, uh, add that instance. So there we have a new instance there. Let's check out our downloads folder there. Seven kilobytes, smaller than the original font. Load it into glyphs. There we are. And oops, I didn't rename it. But if I had done, uh, so there. It's so quick. You can uh, generate these things very, very quick. You can play with these things very, very easily. So. There we are. So it sticks the name into, into the font as well. Um, right, so let's back to uh, here. That's about it with the instances panel. The, uh, the visibility icon, that eye uh, icon, that doesn't work yet. So the idea behind that was to have multiple instances being visible at the same time. Currently, we've only got the default and what I call the current instance. Um, OK, um, I want to show you some cool stuff with SVGs next. Um, oh, no, first of all, I'll show you just navigating around the glyph, around the font. So this glyphs panel, you can click on these things to go to a particular glyph. Um, that one, two, three button there, that switches that display from glyph name to glyph ID. You see they're all zero one, they're all numbers now, back to glyph names. Uh, we can set the glyphs playing with that play icon. And that's sort of quite useful, I find, for just qu having a quick look around the font, seeing the kind of things it's doing, um, saying set it playing and ha have a look. Um, maybe it's a bit of a gimmick, but um, I kind of like it. Right, so let's see. Should we go to stick with Mutator? I'm going to switch. I've got a slight scrolling bug in Safari. I'm going to switch to um, um, Firefox. Uh, right, so this media panel down here, uh, we can export SVG from anywhere uh, 
any, any image we've made here with any of the UI modes, we can, if we like what we see, we can uh, just click that button. And that takes the same SVG that we just um, we, we actually, that's exactly the same SVG as we used for drawing it in SAMHSA, but it just saves it out as, as a separate file. It's very small. Um, you can bring that into a, um, a design app if you want to then use that image further in your, uh, there's, there's uh, Omnibus of, Ar of Argentina, they're using them on their Instagram and so on. Uh, they're, they're quite nicely layered, so you can see the different aspects of them and style them later, you know, well after, um, you, well after they come out of SAMHSA. Um, we've also got export, export PNG, if you prefer to work with PNG. That just takes the SVG, throws it onto an HTML canvas, and grabs the pixels, and dumps that file. If you understand how that works, that's fine. If you, if you don't, it doesn't matter. It exports a PNG of the same thing. So there's that. PNGs are obviously much bigger uh, because they're not structured data. So usually, it's a much better idea to save SVGs. Uh, they work perfectly well on the web, by the way. So they're really good for using, using uh, instead of uh, PNGs and JPEGs. Uh, on web pages. They're typically much smaller and, um, as I say, they're scalable. Uh, SVG animation, that's another kind of SVG we're going to animate. What this does is takes um, takes um, the glyph and runs it through its whole a whole axis. So we can choose, the idea is to choose an axis, then export the SVG animation. And that's what we get. That's one SVG file, and it's doing all that. And see how small it is, 597 bytes. Uh, that's the complete file. Again, just consider how big this would have been if it was an MP4 or a GIF movie. I'll just uh, take this apart a bit so you can see how, how it's built. So. This part of it says run for five seconds. So that's complete length of the animation. That says run forever, so keep doing that. The key times say um, we're going to have two keyframes in this animation, one at the beginning, 0%, one at the end, 100%. That's what the 0 and 1 mean. And here's our first keyframe. This is exactly the same data as is in our font at the minimum width. It's preserved its uh, quadratic curves. Uh, SVG handles quadratic very nicely. This piece of data is the maximum width uh, glyph. Uh, and you can see, if you know SVG, you'll, you'll recognize the M for move, L for line, uh, Q for quadratic curves that, um, that uh, make it to SVG. Uh, one nice thing, though, is that you can, you can edit this kind of stuff. So let's have blue. Uh, so I just saved a new version of that font, uh, of that SVG. So we can do all this kind of stuff after exporting from SAMHSA if we feel like it. Or we can do it um, in SAMHSA if we tune our UI stuff there. We can tweak all this same stuff um, in, in, in these theme UI themes. So that's the basics of that, uh, that uh, media panel there. Uh, I'm actually working on an MP4 exporter, because there are certain kinds of animation that are better as MP4. I've got that working quite nicely in Firefox, again, with no dependencies apart from um, one thing I'll mention. So if anyone wants, I'll, I'll mention that at the end, if anyone, if um, it's not a core part of SAMHSA. Um, right, so that's some SVG stuff. I'm going to go to some more tables now. So. Uh, one table I didn't mention was, or Dave mentioned at the very beginning, was the AVAR table. Not all fonts have an AVAR table, but for those that do, in the Axes panel, we have a little checkbox there. And that brings up a new extra part. You don't, you know, often you don't need to worry about what's happening in AVAR, but if you want to see what's happening, uh, you can. And an AVAR table is a way of remapping um, what an axis does at various points along each axis. So there are some limitations, though. You can't remap what happens at the minimum. You can't remap what happens at the default. And you can't remap what happens at the max. That's represented 
by this section, which uh, this graphic, which is showing the AVAR that happens on the width axis, which is every that the default goes has a straight down arrow, the minimum has a straight down arrow, the max has a straight down arrow. As I move my axes around, though, you can see that the green arrow, which represents our current position, and again, these are clearer to understand if I switch to normalized numbers. Um, so here we're at zero, here we're at minus one, here we're at plus one, reflecting up, up here in the current normalized uh, value. Um, what's happening is that, so, so that value, 0 0.42, is being remapped to a new value slightly greater. We can hover our mouse to see what it, what's actually going on. So that's the original uh, user value, 499.6, almost certainly 500 uh, in the font, so I didn't get bang on. And it's remapped it to 527. So what's going on there is that uh, the designers of IBM Plex have decided that for weight 500, which I believe is uh, medium, um, they wanted a slightly bolder instance than they would have got by default. By default, they would have gone straight down. There would have been no change. But this AVAR transformation is able to just distort that design space a little bit. Uh, so I, I mentioned one restriction, which is you, you can't remap default max and min. The other restriction is that you cannot cause axis number two to influence the mapping of axis number one. Uh, that might sound like a strange thing you might want to do, but it's actually very useful. Um, and it actually ha has been done by all sorts of designers um, outside of variable fonts for years. So it would be a really nice thing if variable fonts supported that. The, the, the basic idea is you don't want your bold condensed to necessarily have the same value on the on the weight axis as your bold. You probably want to bring it back a little bit because otherwise the bold condensed won't be a good match for the bold. Uh, and all axes kind of aesthetically affect each other in this kind of way. So it would be really neat. And there have been various proposals um, about how to fix that with a second with AVAR version two. Who knows whether that will happen? Um, there's no concrete proposal going forward. But if there is a proposal, it could be a nice thing to do to implement it in, a, in an app like this. And people could just start to build fonts, see how they work, um, and then make judgments about what needs to stay, what needs to be changed about this new uh, this new new format. It, it's stuff that's fairly difficult to visualize. So people can the danger is that people say, "Yeah, go ahead," and it turns out to be horribly difficult uh, to use or doesn't solve the problems that we thought it was going to solve. So I think I always feel that in this kind of proposal, an implement, implementation is. It's pretty important. OK, that's AVAR. Uh, next thing I want to show you is the stat uh, panel. Again, not all fonts have a stat panel, uh, but it is part of the um, definition, part of the spec that a variable font must have a stat table. They do work in most places without a stat table. Um, apart from uh, Microsoft Windows, they won't install very well on Microsoft Windows. Um, if you don't have a stat table. So they are important things to add, add to your fonts. Um, sadly, many people have been making very basic or poor or wrong stat tables. And it's important to understand what a stat table is. And I think the, the best way I've come up with ex explaining what stat table is, um, you already know what named instances are. You see them there in, uh, in this font. Now, named instances identify with a name particular points, particular locations in a design space. And so a name, therefore, is attached to a full set of axis values. Every axis has to have a value when you have a, a, when you have a named instance. So light has 300, 100. Extra light has 200, 100. Thin condensed has those two values, 185. In, a, in the stat way of looking at things, it's also helpful to give names to slices of a design space or ranges of a design space, not just individual points. And you can give them give them names, give names to individual points with stat. Um, but that's not the that essential the paradigmatic use of, of stat. So this font is uh, set up uh, pretty nicely. Um, and you see, even though it's a two axis font, uh, we have two drop downs now, one each for each axis where we can adjust 
we can adjust this axis with a name and we don't need to affect the other axis. So this, this axis can be uh, at a different value. I'll show you, uh, it actually works uh, also very nicely with uh, source code. So these are the Adobe uh, set of variable fonts called source code, source sans, source serif. Uh, they also have stat tables. Again, there's, uh, we can adjust our position on one axis without affecting it on another axis. Now, this is an interesting case because, as you see, we've got two drop downs here. We've got one for weight and one for italic. Fine. But the font only actually had a weight axis. Now, what STAT is doing here is it's not only able to express slices in its own design space of this particular font, it's also able to express where it is on an abstract design space that is outside of this font. So, the, the, uh, so there is an abstract design space for source code variable Roman. That includes source code variable italic. Now, the source code variable Roman always has, it's always at, it's stuck on uh, value zero everywhere you go along that weight axis in source code variable Roman. You're still, you're going to be stuck at, uh, at zero on the italic axis. But you could you go to source code variable italic and you see there's no other value but one for that axis. So it has everything else is identical, um, but we're stuck at one. And this helps apps understand that these two variable fonts are intended to work together as a family. So you, it, so that, that they would it would then be reasonable to throw up an axis for an axis, so an axis in the user interface that is not in either of the fonts, but it is expressed in stat. The other neat thing about stat is it defines how to build style names uh, from anywhere in the design space. So we're seeing, um, we see these axis subnames be added together, they're con concatenated together to make this so-called composed name here down the bottom. And there, there are various rules. Uh, the interesting, there's an interesting rule about some names you want to drop. So regular, we often want to drop it. We don't want to use that name. And there's a way in the stat table of saying, don't include this name. It's a little flag in the, in the data that um, a good stat editor, uh, and there's one, uh, I forget the name right now, but it's built by uh, Dalton, I think it's called Stat Make by Dalton Mark uh, 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 on GitHub again for, for, um, for making stat tables. It's not actually that hard to make them um, in TTX, though. I, I've made several in TTX. Uh, if you know your way around, um, if you ever, ever looked at the name table in TTX, it's pretty simple. You just define a, a name, give it a name ID, um, and then use those name IDs. So you, you basically, if you want to make your own stat table in TTX, you would hack the na name table and stat table, uh, take a look at the stat table of IBM Plex or source, the Adobe source fonts. They're made very well. Uh, apart from IBM Plex Italic, that doesn't do it quite right. Uh, the, the Adobe ones, the source ones. Take a look at those and copy the same practices, remembering to add entries in the name table, and you should, should be fine. Uh, right, there's also an add instance button on the stat table. Um, so that's, that, that works just exactly the same as the add instance um, button on the um, axis, uh, axis panel. Right, so let's look at some more of this uh, UI. So, right, so I'm going to close that delta sets uh, window till a little bit later. Uh, right, what's that design space uh, panel doing? I'll load a two axis font to show you around that. Uh, this is a really nice, super small two-axis font, loads super quick. So that's why I use it a lot. Um, it all, as I said earlier, it only it's, uh, has its minimum and maximum at the same as their defaults. So in this view, which is in the normalized view, um, we've, we, we only have action happening in this quadrant. Nothing, these are sort of dead zones where nothing happens. Um, but I can put my mouse down and then move anywhere I like. I've got a nifty two axis controller here. Um, but to decide which axis is hooked up to which, uh, which Cartesian axis, so which goes on the X and which goes the Y, we've got these checkboxes here. So by default, it puts axis number, the first axis on the X, the second axis on, uh, on Y. We can swap those around though, if we feel like we'd rather 
you're moving uh, weight in the x direction. Um, so again, this is quite a nifty way of um, checking out uh, a font in a very casual way for, for bugs and just see, it, see if it's moving smoothly. Um, we can hook axes together. We can actually, so the red is showing you an invalid value. We can't have an axis of attached to both x and y at once. Um, so now as we move this around, both axes are moving together. Uh, and that can be uh, useful in a way I'll mention, uh, mention later. Um, right, so what I want to, you to look at now is the coloring of these arrows. So we've got a, for every point, we've got a pink arrow, a brown arrow, and a green arrow. And let me set everything to maximum. So we're now at the corner master, we're at max weight, max width. What this is showing is that, in fact, let me move one of these down to zero. So what we see, those two instances we see are the default, of course, and then the max width master. And we've only got pink arrows in this, in this view. If we go to max weight, we've only got brown arrows moving the points away from the default. If we put both axes on at once, we've got a green arrow coming into play. Now, a green, the green arrow is the, represents the corner master. So it's the, a new set of deltas. So if we had one set of differences or deltas from the default to define our weight, another set that define our max width, when we have both of those at max, we need another set of deltas that kind of make the glyph nice again, because it's typically a bit ugly at that point. And so what you can see is quite interesting. All these green arrows are kind of pointing roughly back to their start location. I, f I think that's not, uh, quite a nice factor fact of um, corner masters. It's, it's a very general um, thing. This is such an extreme font. It's quite, a, again, it's a good one to look at because you can really see these effects. In most fonts, these uh, corner masters are typically very, very small because the max weight, max width uh, automatic master is already fairly good. It doesn't need much of this modification. This only needs so much because it's moving in, in, from such an extreme to another. Right, um, so that green one is, is bringing it back. What I also want you to look at are the colorings of these delta sets. So what these delta sets are, are the sets of points that are ultimately how each master is saved. So the, the, the default, as I said, is uh, stored in the original glyph table. So we don't need to store that as a, as a variation. The maximum width master is our pink set of deltas. And we can, we can see them by this UI here. And this is experimental. If you click where I just clicked, which is on that number, that'll throw up a pop-up in the version that's live. Uh, but this version will go live soon. So what we're seeing here is a list of all the points with their deltas. We can see that see it for uh, two axes at once. Uh, can we? Uh, right. I think maybe we didn't scroll that enough. Uh, let me switch to Safari for this bit. Yeah, this isn't re quite ready for prime time, but it's a nifty way to show. But as I say, you can get these values um, in the. Right. Okay. We've only got we got one. Okay. We're just we're just looking at one set of values now, are we? Uh, right. Uh, right. Well, the point is though, as we look at um, our pink arrows, we can see those values changing, and what's happening with those values is they're being multiplied by the current normalized value. As we saw, if we multiply something by one, it stays where it is. So our value for the maximums, they are one. That is those values there, 20, zero, 27, zero. If we look at our point numbers, we look at point number seven here, it's pink arrow was 160, 54. So that pink arrow there is 160, 54. 
Um, we can see it moving around nicely there. Uh, I'm now, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going to switch to the live version for, for this. Right. Right. So on the live version, you click on those numbers and you get this kind of readout. So that's at the default, everything's zero. If we whack these up to the max, we get these values. Um, so I'm, as I say, I'm working on a, a new uh, a upgrade to this. So you'll see these changing dynamically, um, which makes things a lot clearer. Um, but the, what I want to show you is how that green arrow behaves. But before I do that, I want to show you what these triangles mean. So this part of the UI here, um, I'm going to flip back to the presentation and go to this slide here. Again, this um, graphic was taken from the spec, like those um, two design space um, graphics, by the way. Um, so what you're looking at here is you're looking at that axis going from minus 1 to plus 1. So you've seen that scale before. This vertical scale, I haven't shown you before, and that indicates how axis position corresponds to the value between 0 and 1. It's like between 0 and 100%. How much of that delta is going to be applied? So if you're at 1, at the max, your scalar is going to be 1. So this is a typical um, so-called delta set tuple that you would get for a max master. Um, you can also have responses like this. So this, this is a kind of master that responds with its full effect somewhere in the middle of the design space, somewhere at, lay, say, 0.6. And this, if you think about it, this is what um, intermediate masters have to do. They have to have a maximum effect somewhere in the middle of the design space, then go trail off. Maybe another master is take, taking over. Uh, typically, you'd see a kind of X shape crossing that. Another, as another master takes, takes over the role and, 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 and does more of the work. And then the, the effect tails off entirely after a certain point. So the, you see this kind of shape for intermediate masters. Uh, and actually, to demonstrate that, I'll show you uh, my dear old horse. So this glyph is made up of 100 points, each one in 15 uh, Sorry, so it's 15 masters. So it's two default, two, two extremes with 15 intermediates in between. Um, and what these, this delta set view shows is which two are active at any moment. And you can see those black triangles there are very thin. So those are, this is exactly the same as what we saw here. So imagine this was much thinner. It would have a much narrower range of um, effectiveness. So here, the way the intermediate masters are built is that only two of them have an effect at any one time. Remember that the colors here are matching the colors of these arrows. So these arrows are very much built exactly one to one from this delta, from these deltas that are worked out dynamically. And then added together, all everything that is then scaled and then added together becomes the total delta at that particular point. I hope that's clear. Um, I'm going to go back to that two-axis setup. So that, that horse, that was just a single-axis glyph with lots of intermediate masters. So here we've got, again, a very simple, very common setup, four masters in a typical traditional multiple master setup. Um, but what, what's interesting is what happens uh, with this scalar value. So here, you can see that the red needle representing the current position is, we go to normalize, is at 0 0.7. So because that's a totally straight line, we're going to get kind of the same number out because um, it's a straight number from 0 to 1. That is the function that changes nothing about the input number. We get 0 0.702. That is then multiplied by our original numbers to get um, our, our dynamic set of deltas. Um, again, the weight is at 0 0.687. The scalar, if I hover my mouse, is come on, 0 0.687. Uh, so that's multiplied by all those deltas. There's something interesting happening there that with the, this scalar value here. 
again, of course, these needles are in exactly the same place. You can't have the value for weight in one delta set be any different in the next delta set. That, the sort of values on each delta set have to be identical. So that, those needles are in exactly the same place. What happens is these get multiplied together when there's more than one of them. So this will be 0 0.7 times 0 0.687, which is, of course, somewhat smaller than either of those values. It's not the average, as you might have assumed. And I think a lot of people kind of always assume it was the average. It's a multiplication. So the interesting thing about that is if we set these, oh, by the way, you can type these values if you like. Uh, so if those are both at 0 0.5, so halfway along the axis, you might have, ex I think a lot of people expected this also to be at 0 0.5. But if you think about it long enough, the maths won't really work out like that. And as you see, it's at 0 0.25. So these green arrows are much smaller than you might expect. So the effect of that corner master has pretty much gone away by as, as you come to the center of your design space in both in two axes at once. If these are tied together, so if the um, if we tie them together like this, whoops. So now we've got both axes moving together, and multiplying these. This is then the square of that single value because we're, we're tying it together. This is the product of those two things. It's a square. So we get very much a nonlinear response to uh, interpolation because we're moving on two axes at once. And this nonlinearity is, um, is, is exploited beautifully by the Hoy uh, system of, of, of underwear. Um, so that's where that comes from. Uh, if you think about it, you can keep adding uh, axes that you drive together and get cubes get uh, power four, power five, however many you like, by having multiple axes moving together on the same scales, then this becomes to the power of the number of axes you've, cho you've chosen together. And again, very small effects, uh, except when that axis is at its peak. Uh, right, the, there's one other thing I want to show you about uh, corner masters, because they're, they're fascinating things. Um, and that is their effect on the Loki, loci view that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, I'm giving you a quick preview there, but I didn't mean to. Let me uh, reload. Um, so, right, if we switch to loci mode, what this is doing, and it's hooked, uh, it's connected with how you control the, these things here in the design space panel. Um, bit of a weird view of, on a font. You've probably not seen one like this before unless you played with Samsung. What it's doing, let me collapse some of these windows, um, is it's showing you the set of all possible positions for a point as it moves along a particular axis. So the, the blue railway track, the idea is there are track. Um, the, the, the metaphor is that you, the point isn't allowed to go anywhere off the track if you move its weight axis. Sorry, that's width axis moving. So each point is moving along. It's constrained to that track. As we move weight, again, we can't move anywhere except along these straight tracks. And that's true of any um, single axis. The tracks are straight. Um, they can be bent only. They can be piecewise. Uh, they can be, they're always straight, but they can be lots of straight pieces joined together. And that's the case in, with intermediate masters. Or if your default isn't proportional between your min and max, you'll see a single kink in, at the default. Um, if you have lots of intermediate masters, then you can have a zigzag line. But these can never be curved, these points. The interesting thing, though, about it is that you'll see the shape of the other axis. So as I'm, I'm only moving width now, but you can see the red railway tracks are changing shape. And that might be unexpected. So you see the possibilities available for you for weight are changing depending on where your width axis is. And this, again, is a consequence of your corner master. If you didn't have a corner master, and I'm actually thinking of having a toggle there so you can see what the effect would be if you disabled that set of deltas. So you could disable the corner master by unchecking uh, number two there. Um, then you would see no change. Um, that those uh, the, the magnitudes and the angles of those uh, tuples 
would be constant um, on the other axis. But it's, as, as I say, the corner master is, is adding all that, that power. Anyway, if we join them together, we can start to move multiple axes together. The, the only way currently you can move two axes together is uh, on this design space view. We can see the effect, these curves that are in the font all along. They've always been there with any two, two, two axes set up. We've got this uh, low cost for each point, which is a quadratic curve. Quadratic because there's two axes here. Uh, they'd be cubic if you had a corner master and a three axis set up, all moving, all hooked up in the same manner. Uh, right, that's about it, I think, for the uh, visual side of things. So I, I think I'm going to have a quick have a break there for the visual side and go on to some uh, command line stuff um, afterwards. Um, so I'm going to stop for questions on the visual side. So I'll um, switch my camera off for a, so switch my screen off for a bit and remember where it is and uh, stop for questions. I haven't been watching the chat, by the way. I'm sorry. Um, so if someone else can uh, stop presenting. OK, anyone, any questions from anybody? Um, I have one. I have them, yeah. Um, I was noticing when I put uh, my fonts into SAMHSA, uh, some of the glyphs, um, let's say fractions, um, would uh, be represented in a way that's not the way I want them to look. But if I put them into other environments that render uh, variable fonts, they look fine. And oh, so, I, yeah, I and, and I think I that that that's, it's, it's, that. a sec, it's oh. some kind of second order um, representation or something. Um, and so, I, what I was wondering is, is is SAMHSA being picky, and um, I don't need to worry about it, or I do need to worry about it, and SAMHSA is is going to give me a better idea of what things are going to look like in more different environments, and something I need to attend to. There is an open issue on uh, composites which are more than one level deep. Uh, so these are reasonably common. So when I wrote the original data model, I was assuming that they didn't happen because they they actually didn't happen in Apple for many years. So I thought. I wrongly assumed that people weren't making these fonts. Uh, that is an open issue. I need to uh, rewrite some code to handle that. So as long as it's a composite that's more than one level deep that's doing that, I'm I'm on the case. Um, if it's not, um, let me know. OK, so, so you're going to say just I'll, I'll say what I think I heard you say, which is that um, this is a, a thing that you'll fix in SAMHSA and the from the point of view of the orthodoxness of the variable font, it's actually OK. Uh, it is. It's perfectly legal to have multi-level um, components. So it's composite. that's a composite glyph, which brings in another composite glyph uh, to an arbitrary depth level. That is perfectly legal, and I should be handling it properly, but I'm not currently. So, But if they're just one level deep, uh, they, should be, uh, they should be right on. That's, that's def definitely what I found. Thank you so much. Thanks, Evan. Anyone else? Um, OK, I'll go on to the um, some command line stuff now. Uh, so that, uh, let's set up the screen. Um, Lawrence, um, do you mind if I ask you another question while you're setting okay. up? Go for it. Um, I was wondering, um, the stat table editor that you were pointing to earlier, I haven't tried using it, and maybe it's a really wonderful way of doing things, but um, it occurred to me that it might be really sweet if it was possible to edit your stat table in SAMHSA. Is that something you would ever consider? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I've currently made the decision that it's not going to be exporting variable fonts anytime soon. Um, I've got enough on my plate. You know, make, There's plenty I need to do to get the static TTFs ready for production. You know, there's, a few, there's some things about those that aren't um, production ready, although I'll mention. Um, but that doesn't mean I can't. Uh, you, could, you couldn't grab, let's say, the results or an edit that you perform in SAMHSA as TTX code. That could be a handy way 
to build your um, build your stat table with a nice graphical UI, export it as TTX, then build it into bring it into your font that way. So that's that level of stuff. I I wouldn't consider editing a variable font, but it's a nice way of edit uh, exporting the current state of something that you've edited. And, and similarly, the named instances. Let's say you add a load of named instances. You could export a new FR table and throw that and bring that into your existing font using TTX very easily. So there are some ways which we can get um, on the path to exporting variable fonts, but not actually doing it. Does that answer your question? Yes, very much so. Thank you so much. OK, and same with AVAR as well, by the way. That would work. Um, that methodology would work nicely for AVAR. Rock and roll. Uh, OK, am I sharing? I don't think I am, am I? Let me remind myself where that is. Am I sharing? I'm not sharing, am I? Uh, no, yeah. where's, the, where's the sharing thing? Uh, it should be at the bottom right. No. Uh, Present now. I've got my rec. You uh, have to uh, roll over the screen and at the bottom left. There, uh, right? Sorry. Oh, sorry. It was it was hidden some for some for some reason. Okay. All uh, right. Okay. Everyone there. Yeah, we, we see your screen. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, what I'm what, what I'm I, I'm in I'm in the uh, Samsung folder in my local machine right now. So that's um, uh, well, a few extra debugging uh, files there. So those are all the uh, JavaScript files there. Uh, by the way, Samsa core.js is where all the JavaScript parsing happens. So that's that's the lot that's the um, stuff that turns a variable font into Samsung's own data structures. That is then used by this file. That's the main web page file. So that builds the user interface, handles all your interaction with the with the th with the thing I've been showing you for the last hour. It it uses so that uses all the functionality that's built into Samsung Core. Samsung Core doesn't know anything about user interfaces. It's just um, doing maths and and symbol manipulations and stuff like that. Um, but we can use it, which means we can use it with any with with anything. We don't need to. We don't need a, anything graphical to use it, which is handy if we want to make a command line tool, which is this thing, Samsung CLI dot JS. Um, so how we can run JavaScript on the command line is with a thing called Node. It's a open source um, uh, JavaScript engine based on the JavaScript engine that was inside Chrome called V8. People uh, about eight ten years ago now grabbed just the JavaScript code and turned it into a standalone thing independent of any browser. So if you type node like that, then the name of your script, your JavaScript file, you run it. And you can just print out things to the, just like any uh, Unix utility. And if you just, so I've just done that, and it has printed out some help about how to use this tool. And what it's for currently, um, there. Some other places I could take it, such as making specimens and so on. Um, but currently, it's for making in instances. So um, we do dash dash. Sorry, that's printed out its help. And so there are some examples down there at the bottom. And this way of using things here. Oops, sorry, make the type bigger, says Rhino. A bit better. Okay. Um, so it's this line here. That is the way of generating a specific instance you want at a certain weight and width. Uh, of course, those are the tags that you know well. Um, so. What we do, what we need to net type next is our font file. So we can type on shrift and what instance do we want? Well, let's say weight 567 with 87. 
And that's made an instance. OK. Um, it's called SAMHSA instance zero.ttf. Um, and it's in our um, downloads. No, sorry, it's in our SAMHSA folder. There it is. Uh, where is it? Here. So that has just been made on the command line. I can bring it into glyphs. There it is there. So that's a, a static true type font made using exactly the same code as you saw being used in the graphical tool. But now we're doing it all on the command line. Um, another thing you might think could be useful to doing stuff on the command line is uh, imagine you had a web server that is actually serving um, variable fonts, but also serving static fonts for users that can't, um, for some reason, can't access vari can't use variable. This is a, a pretty quick way of generating these um, these static fonts. That might be one way you'd want to do something without all the, without a graphical user interface. Um, in time, I, I hope that this method is useful for uh, producing actual uh, uh, custom instances, or maybe making your instances for for production for shipping from your variable font. So you, this is your master file that you use and spin off instances when you need them uh, to sell them. Uh, it's very fast. Um, I'll show you other things it can do. So we don't need to type specific instances like that. We can also type the word named. I just made 15 instances uh, out of that font just under a second. It's actually a lot quicker than that if I don't have um, a video chat running. And this is a pretty old machine. So on a modern, um, on a modern machine, I, I think you get that down to 200 mega, mega milliseconds um, on a pretty big font. So this is 836 glyphs, two axis. Um, oh, I'll show you it on some uh, test font now. So this is uh, a, font, a load of test fonts from Arfic um, of, of Taiwan. Uh, They've sent, they sent me a 1,000 um, glyph font, a 2,000 glyph font, a 5,000 glyph font, a 10,000 glyph font. Um, I was talking to them about uh, maybe using SAMHSA in some production. Uh, and they also sent me a 65,535 glyph font, which is the maximum number of glyphs you're allowed to have in a true type font. Um, they all work really quite fine. Uh, so here's, uh, here we are working on the 1,000 glyph font. 325 milliseconds. Now, uh, in fact, you can put the word time in front of anything you do in Unix. They actually get a, so that 325 is what um, SAMHSA itself has reported. Um, here we're getting a system reporting 355 milliseconds. So there's a little bit of startup time for Node that the time function allows for. So if we can look at that 355, uh, time for a single weight out of that thousand glyph font. And by the way, this is a two axis CJK font. So these glyphs that there are 1,000 of are actually very complicated. This is not a simple font at all. Um, I'm going to do, I'm going to time it against font tools. Um, uh, a module in font tools called uh, Instancer, which uh, so we do it like this, font tools, var, lib, instancer. Now the same font. We have a slightly different syntax for the um, axes like that. So we've got four and a half seconds there, so four. Um, 4,500 milliseconds. So we're seeing a you know a well over 10 times improvement um, over over font tools, um, and we can I can actually set this going on the on the this gigantic font here. So this is a 57 megabyte variable font. It's going to produce a 27 megabyte um, instance. There, it did it in six and a half seconds. There's a seven-year-old machine. Um, it's got a video call running. Um, font tools isn't able to handle anything above the 20,000 uh, glyph font. So 
the me memory management is 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 pretty cool in this. It's what it's doing is it's bringing each glyph definition in, then bringing in the very variable information just for that glyph, then writing out um, the new glyph position and dumping what it had for the previous glyph. So it's only processing one glyph at a time, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, I tried this on all the um, Google variable fonts. There were 36 families at the time, which I think that was 49 variable fonts. It, it produced them all in around 30 seconds. So that's around, I think it was 800 instances it was making. And some of those are pretty large fonts as well. Um, I tried it through font tools, and it was around 18 minutes on a comparable machine. Um, so the, the, these are significant differences. And if you and certain operations, you become possible now um, in a production workflow uh, that weren't possible before. Uh, at this point, I have to state the caveats of, uh, of, the, of these instances that it's making, um, which are uh, written them down somewhere. Right, there's no. There's no instantiated kerning. You get the default kerning, unfortunately. Um, there's no RVRN feature variation swapping. So you get, again, the default glyph for, for every character. Uh, for every, every glyph in, you get, you get what uh, the default was. Um, MVAR is not processed, so that handles changes in, vari in changes in vertical metrics and so on, and the OS2 table data that can have variable um, qualities as well. That's not handled. Uh, the CVAR table is also not handled. That's um, a very clever, potentially very useful way of having variable hinting um, working. I'm not sure if anyone's doing anything with CVAR yet. But, but um, the good news is that all these tables, once I get around to doing them, they're not that hard to implement. They're just a bit fiddly. They, they use exactly the same maths as the, as the glyph, glyphs moving around and, and changing under variation. Is I don't expect it to add very much to the time. So the, these comparisons will be um, affected a little bit, but not, not dramatically. Um, so that's about all I have. Um, so I'll stop there and hand back to Dave in case he has any more questions. Or I haven't been looking at the chat. So um, I'll stop again for questions. And then we can maybe explore some of your own fonts if you want to share your screens or keep this going as long as you want, as long as you like. Go there, Dave. Hmm, maybe not. Uh, anyone else want to, um, questions? Anything, anything about how this works? Um, things you might want to do with it? Uh, there are some. Feel free to turn your mic off. Um, yeah. Um this is uh, Lenny. Thank you so much for presenting on this stuff. This is really cool. I, I was working with Dave for a bit on uh, Google Fonts and um, implemented some of the variable fonts uh, integrations for the, the Google Fonts website. I'm actually trying to use SAMHSA to build out a Figma plugin to oh. render out. Um, essentially, uh, the Figma uh, canvas is is a um, its own kind of programming uh, engine uh, that uses events to uh, promote what Figma can and can't render, but it can yep. render SVGs. Um, you, you can send it uh, SVG objects. So I'm mm -hmm. planning on, um, on on using SAMHSA as the uh, browser component to render out what, what a user wants to generate and then send it to the Figma um, canvas. Do you, do you have any suggestions on uh, ways to uh, essentially use SAMHSA to replace the... Uh, the font rendering engine that that the browser would normally use when the only thing that is able to access the font um, is SAMHSA. So when you're not able to actually see the uh, font, it looks like from the examples that you showed, um, all the previews being that they're SVGs does that by default. But anything I should be keeping in mind here? Uh, well, the, the main choice would be whether to use SVG or a static font. So you could spin out a static font and effectively have a SAMHSA be your browser polyfill. There's actually a polyfill demo in the in the repo, um, so that may well be the most efficient way because these these static fonts are produced pretty quickly. Um, it's up to you if you if you if it's a it's like the decision in Illustrator if you want to make sure you keep everything text, or is it okay for um, the, the maybe let's say the knowing exactly what's going on, you might want to convert to outlines, convert to curves. And 
um, yeah, you have you have that choice. It's a browser. You can throw fonts at it. You can throw SVGs, um, and Samsung reduces both. So I, I I I need to know more about the exact use case. I think. Yeah, before, yeah. I, I'll, 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 I'm probably think. going to be in touch. But thank you for developing this. It's it's really made a huge huge uh, leap in what I was going to do. Excellent. That's great to hear. Uh, any other questions? Is there a, like, does this, um, I see in the chat that somebody asked whether this should be used instead of. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, like I'm not getting my on the chat. So if you, if I'm not. That's asked, fine, that's fine. Just want to um, is there a reason or something? Does it skip a bunch of things for instantiation of ver uh, static fonts from a variable font? Or how is it 10 times faster than, uh, than font tools? Um, I believe it's the way it's um, just processing one glyph at once. So there's not mm -hmm. very much in memory. So apart from the glyph table and the GVAR table, that giant font, 57 mm -hmm. megabytes, is tiny. So mm -hmm. on, on startup, it brings all those tiny tables into memory so it knows um, the basic structure of what's going on. Then it's just one by one, 0 to 65,535. Mm -hmm. until we're done. And it brings a glyph, brings some GVAR data, processes it according to the, axi according to the design space location, dumps it out to disk um, with very little intermediate stuff happening with that memory. That's all that I haven't looked at the font tools code. So I, sure. I, I imagine it's expanding the entire font into a, a giant stuff, really you know, loads of stuff in memory. I, I, previous mm -hmm. versions of SAMHSA did that kind of thing. Um, which could be faster for certain, if you have a very small font, it's actually faster to do that because then mm -hmm. you can bring everything in in one read off the disk. That's actually a faster operation than doing um, a thousand small write, a small reads, and again, for the writes. Um, mm -hmm. So that it, it is potentially faster to do it that way. But once you get to bigger fonts, you know, a thousand glyphs plus, I think mm -hmm. you're on to, uh, you're risking stuff with memory, um, which even on a fast machine is, is gonna cause problems um, on a web server, a shared web server, even it's going to it's going to be horrible. If your memory management is not is not really good. Um, but I, I again another caveat with um, this isn't intended as a criticism of font tools. It's not meant as a live uh, instance generator at all. Um, mm -hmm. There may be ways of 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 tuning it of of using uh, using it that I'm not aware of. Um, that I, I, I'm not an experienced font tools user and programmer. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd be interested to hear from a font tools expert if, if, if font tools could be improved in, that, in, in, that, in this kind of way. Sure. And I, I may be wrong in some of my assumptions that there's maybe there's lots more checks that will mm -hmm. take, that will be doubling or tripling or multiplying by 10 my time. Um, but I don't think so. I'm pretty confident that the bulk of the time is in the G bar. Hey, Lawrence, sorry to interrupt. Um, I, I uh, was uh, muted and not paying attention. Uh, oh, since you said you were trying to reach me. Uh, no, I just, I, I, I'd come to an end after the command line stuff. So I wondered if you had anything more or wanted to, uh, I threw it open to questions, but if you had any as yeah. well. No, that's it. Great. Um, yeah, uh, 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 as always, you know, I got caught up with people messaging me and asking me stuff at work. And okay. So managed to pay attention, but I'm glad it's recorded. So <laughs> All right. I'll be sure to watch it at 3 a.m. with my baby. Excellent. And I'll um, I'll push that change with the uh, those uh, delta values changing dynamically. That's a, a really nice improvement, I think. So that'll go live in the next, next few days. Uh, All right. Well, yeah, I have yeah. to go to another meeting. So um, thanks very much, Lawrence. It's the end of the schedule right. time. Of course, you're, you and the other 35 people still here <laughs> are welcome to continue. Okay. Um, once everybody leaves the call, eventually I'll get an email with a recording, and um, you know we'll 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 uh, be able to um, put it up on YouTube. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming along. It's been a pleasure. Um, I'm very happy to stay around for another 10 minutes or so if there are uh, there are questions. So um, I'll maybe actually. Look at these things in the chat now. Anyway, thanks, Dave, for hosting. Yeah. Um, and, Thank you, everyone. Yeah. OK, cheers, Dave. I have a question about um, where you would like to take it. I mean, it's already an amazingly sort of big tent. It does a lot of things and does them well. 
Um, but I'm wondering, uh, you know, where you are sort of hoping this will go, like in the next like year or two or something. Yeah, I've obviously been wondering about that. The big one, the big improvement would be CFF2. That's not a trivial thing to add. So this is the the other format of variable fonts that is um, part of the uh, the official spec. Is the um, is Adobe's uh, way of making fonts? Uh, well, for, currently for the fonts they make, they make both CFF2 and TrueType. Um, the nice thing, if I do go ahead with CFF2, and that will need funding, by the way, I'm not. I don't think I have the, enough free time and um, um, money in the bank to to go ahead with with that without some funding. Um, I, that the great thing about that will be cubic curves. So you'll be able to see the very curves you designed in your in glyphs font lab proper font. They will appear in front of you moving around. I think that will be a significant improvement. Um, as, as well as being able to debug CFF2 um, binaries. So th there are some good good things about that. Um, the other nice thing about getting to that point of CFF2, we could go via an intermediate stage, which would give us a lot of the benefits and some more, which would be if I can handle design space and UFO. So imagine dragging a design space file onto SAMHSA, and then SAMHSA pulling in all the UFO and glyph data that it needs to build the same UI from 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 UFO data. That's that's feasible, I believe. Um, and so you'd get those benefits of seeing your original cubic curves, um, and you'd also be able to use Samsung much earlier in the, in your workflow. So, and I absolutely let you load it when not all of your glyphs were compatible. So uh, all these really annoying things about glyph compatibility would you be able to play with your cap a that was compatible even if your cap even if no other glyph in the font was compatible or the ufo didn't even contain that glyph i think this could be a really uh nice way of looking at work in progress using this kind of tool at a very early stage uh, in development maybe trying out multiple design space files on the same set of ufos now, it, it, there's a lot of possibility it brings up. So that's, uh, I, I'd want to do those, I think, as one um, project, I think, if, if that went ahead. So I think they'd both, they'd both be very valuable. Uh, the great. second one would be, uh, yeah, people talked about exporting variable fonts. Um, I'm not currently planning to compete with Glyphs and FontLab. Um, I think that would be a, a fool, fool's game. Um, but one thing I found in the variable font workshops I've been doing, uh, where you just think of, you get the class to think of a nice symbol and turn it into a variable font and turn it, make it variable. I think that kind of level of making a variable font would be possible with this kind of tool. So imagine, you know, create a new font button and you make a, um, make a symbol, or maybe it doesn't really have many, much in the way of drawing tools. You just copy and paste an SVG that you made in Illustrator. Because SVGs are, you know, they're all around. You know, uh, Font Awesome, you can download all, all those things as SVGs. Drop it into here, into SAMHSA as the default, then say how it changes along an axis just by dragging those points around to new locations, completely sidestepping the problem of compatibility. You know, by definition, that the data structure would not allow incompatible glyphs if you handle things that way. And I think the educational aspect of that, even if this is not for producing usable, sellable, um, deployable fonts, um, the educational thing that you've achieved by that, sidestepping the problem of compatibility, which is a really boring production side of things that you just have to think about all the time, I think it would be very valuable. Uh, so that's uh, that's one uh, for simple SVG symbols. I think it would be worth it. Uh, I already mentioned one. Th the other thing that I'd like to do is, if there are serious proposals for spec improvements, AVAR two I mentioned. Um, Adam actually mentioned uh, one relation to symbol fonts, icons, pictures recently on another thread on a on a GitHub thread. Um, yeah, that's maybe a out of scope of what SAMHSA's for, but AVAR2 certainly well within scope. And imagining having an AVAR2 engine built into SAMHSA so you can see how, an, how a font would move with an AVAR2 table, um, spin out instances from it um, with your axes at these positions that wouldn't be possible if the font only had an AVAR version one table. Um, 
yeah so that and i think as i mentioned already i think that these proposals i think if you're serious about proposal you owe it to the people reviewing your proposal to make a prototype make it make a prototype environment make a prototype font um and this i think this is a pretty good way of doing that um there but there's by no means it could be the only one i mean other font tools could do the same but i, I if it's an open source and someone can someone from Microsoft say would contribute that code for handling AVAR2, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I think those are the three main sort of future plans which I have, uh, the, the you know, significant ones. Anything else? Looking through some notes to see if I had anything I wanted to say. No, that's that's all I had. So, um, yep. Any other? I, again, I'd better look at the chat in case there's some people trying to say this thing. Um. Okay. Um, I haven't read everything, but anyone who wants to speak, turn off your mic and, and shout, or else we'll um, call it quits. Is, is that it? Last call. It is for me. Thank you so much. OK. All right. Cheerio, everybody. Uh, let me know your experiences with SAMHSA, good and bad. You know, little tweaks are really important, as well as um, big changes. Uh, so bug fix it. If you see what you think looks like a bug, do let me know. Um, or think of a, a neat little feature. Um, absolutely, let me know, and I'll, I'll put it on my list. Um, yeah, OK, that's about it. Thanks, thanks everybody. I'll say goodbye. Thanks okay. a lot. It's a great tool. Thank you. I don't know who that was saying, but uh, thank you anyway. <laughs> OK, bye-bye then. <laughs>